Next on Garden Line, ornamentals at McKinnon Park in Sioux Falls. Trees that attract songbirds. These are very attractive and turn bright orange in the fall. And decorative plants native to South Dakota. This program is funded in part by Swiftel Communications. Hello and welcome to Garden Line. I'm Stephen Monk. Tonight on our show, we'll visit an SDSU wildlife expert who will explain why certain trees and shrubs attract songbirds. Also, a biologist at SDSU will share key information about a couple of decorative plants that are native to South Dakota. And in our Garden of the Week feature, we will travel to McKinnon Park in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, to see the beautiful and decorative ornamentals lining the walkways. As always, our panel of lawn and garden experts will answer your questions, so get ready to call in. Our panelists are here with the most up-to-date information about gardening, lawn care, insects, trees, and a host of other lawn and garden concerns that may be coming in. Join me in this, joining me in the studio to answer your questions tonight is John Keekafer, Brookings County Extension Educator, Jerry Mills, Brown County Extension Horticulture Educator, and John Ball, Extension Forestry Specialist. The phone number for you to call with your lawn and garden questions is 1-866-595-SDSU. Again, that is 1-866-595-7378. Helping to answer our phones tonight are the Brookings Master Gardeners. And remember, when you're calling in your question, please provide our phone volunteers with as much information as possible about your garden problem. Be ready to provide a description of the problem, when the problem first appeared, is it affecting any other surrounding plants, and some moisture or and soil conditions that may be affecting it as well. Now before we get to your questions, we have some important information for you. Gardline went on location with SDSU Wildlife and Fishery Sciences Professor Casey Jensen, in which we learned which plants to plant along that will help attract songbirds and why. I'm Casey Jensen, an assistant professor in the Department of Wildlife and Fishery Sciences at South Dakota State University. And I want to spend a few minutes today talking about plantings that you can put in your yard specifically to attract uh, songbirds. Uh, one choice that's particularly good here is a hawthorn. Um, you can see here it has some uh, fairly substantial uh, thorns that offer protection for nests that birds may make in your yard and also uh, the hawthorn provides some fruits that persist uh, throughout the year and will provide a good winter food source for birds. Uh, if you have young children, uh, hawthorn might be something you want to uh, consider not planting because of uh, the danger that these thorns may, uh, uh, may offer uh, young children. There are some other uh, shrubs as well that provide food and cover uh, and we can uh, go look at a few of those as well. Okay, here are some uh, examples of vines that are, are good plantings for birds. They provide, uh, in the case here of the river grape, provides both cover and food. You can see some developing grapes here that will uh, be good, a good food source, particularly in late summer and fall and the vines of both the river grape and this five-leafed example, the woodbine, uh, offer good nesting cover uh, for birds and the, and the vines also make attractive cover around your, your yard. Uh, the, again, these are very good plantings for, to attract birds to your yard. Um, this is a mountain ash. This is a, a really good choice for a planting for a tree in your yard. You can see it has uh, a nice fruiting body here and these are very attractive and, and turn bright orange in the fall and they persist through the winter and are uh, used by birds for food. 
Uh, other tree species would include the red mulberry and the hackberry, which would be good choices for, uh, for trees that provide both cover and food. Uh, mulberries can make a mess in your yard and particularly around your driveway, so you might want to consider that. Some native plant choices that would be good would be wild plum and chokecherry, but in small yards they may not be appropriate because they tend to sucker and form uh, clumps that could easily overtake a small area. But in larger yards or farmsteads, they're a very good choice. There are uh, many, many uh, plants that can be used to attract birds and lots of them are outlined in, in this publication put out by the uh, South Dakota Department of Game, Fish and Parks on uh, sharing your space with wildlife that offers good suggestions for wildlife plantings. All right, well we want to thank Casey for that information on those plants that help attract songbirds here in South Dakota. This is also now the time of the segment of the program where we go around the table to see what the latest, hottest things are as far as in the world of horticulture. John, what do you have for us in the insect world? Well, I'm trying to, to beat it, people to the punch a little bit again this week. Uh, we've got a number of, of insects that are appearing at this time of year and one of them that we're starting to see show up are some of what are called digger bees or minor bees. They're called that because they end up burrowing through the ground and, and producing some tunnels, making little mines or, or digging out their nests. Uh, we got a number of different species here in South Dakota. Most of them are reasonably large sized bees. They're fairly dark in color and they fly rapidly. And so people will see these things flying around their patios, for example, or around driveways, sidewalks, places like that, any place where it's a little dry and they start worrying about the aggressiveness of these bees. And they're really not aggressive, but the males tend to fly rapidly back and forth in front of people, and so they get a little bit nervous. But if you see in the next picture here, what really is going on, um, they start building their burrows off on the, on the far right here. You can see that nest or that hole going underground. They'll make their nest, and the females will go in and out, providing some nectar, uh, mostly pollen, but a little nectar to those developing larvae. And, uh, the males just kind of hang around and wait for the females. And so what people are really seeing are the males. They're not really going to cause any harm. Um, they're actually an insect that you want to have in your garden. Great pollinators, but they do make people nervous because of their size and the rapid flight. Okay. Will they sting just like honeybees? Or? They can sting. Unlike a honeybee, they don't have a barbed sting, so they can sting you more than once. But uh, they, they're not likely to sting. You'd really have to work at it to make them sting you. You'd probably have to grab them in this case to make them sting you. Okay, so control or to get rid of them really wouldn't be a automatic right. in this case. Right, okay. you don't really want to. If, if it is in a place where you really decide you can't tolerate having them around, try keeping the area watered for a while and just every day go out and sprinkle that. They really don't like those muddy conditions and it may be enough to deter them. Okay, thanks, Sean. Jerry, in the general world of horticulture, well, I'm going to do the same thing that John just did. Uh, I've got a couple of slides. Uh, if they put the first one up, I'm going to talk about something coming up in the garden, and that's onion harvest. Uh, those onions are getting close to harvest. Um, when some of the tops uh, start to go over and start to break down, then it signals that harvest is near. When about a half to three quarter of those tops have gone over, one can encourage the rest of the plants to uh, hasten the, the drying process by knocking them over with a backside of a steel garden rake. This will crimp the stems and stop the growth and, and getting, get them ready for harvest. Uh, several days later, lift the onions out of the ground, give them kind of a twist as you lift them, that'll separate the roots from the soil, and then go ahead and remove any of the excess uh, soil that uh, is around the bulb. Leave them lay in the garden. Leave them lay in the garden overnight. Uh, it is, uh, if it's extremely hot and a very bright day, you want to be careful about doing that because uh, they may even actually just sunburn laying there in the garden. So if it's an extremely hot day, take them directly to the drying racks. Um, otherwise, leave them overnight and start the next morning. If I could have slide two then. Oh, it's already up. Thank you. Uh, next, move the onions to the drying rack or braid them and hang them up to dry. Provide a warm, well-ventilated area out of direct sunlight. It may take up to three weeks to fully dry the tops. When the tops are then dry, 
why you can cut or twist the stem to remove the top. They are ready that now for storage. And that's the next slide. Store the onions in a well-ventilated, dry, cool area. Uh, the cooler, the better. In fact, down to about uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit is the best uh, storage temperature for onions. Check them frequently and discard any soft or rotten bulbs. A properly stored onion should keep until about midwinter or sometimes even a little bit longer. Okay, thank you, Jerry, for all mm -hmm. that information on onions. Now, just prior to this, if they form a seed head on top, yep. should you address that? Um, the seed head is uh, those larger sets that you plant that are more prone to bolt and pr produce that seed head. Uh, that's one that's not going to store very well if you allow it to go into that seed head. There's another type of uh, onion they call a stiff neck. Uh, it develops a very tough uh, Pardon, but maybe even woody type or, or very tough stem on it and, uh, and, and a tough top, those don't store very well either. So keep those out of the storage process. Eat those as you go, right okay. fresh out of the garden. All right, thank you. Thank you. John, this is the time of year where we start getting quiet. Well, we always have a number of questions on trees, but trees are really active at this time of the year, it seems like. No, no they're drowning. <laughs> uh, you know, this state, it's the land of the twos. It's either too hot too cold, too dry, too wet. It's never too nice. And that's the problem with trying to grow trees in the state. And this year for most of the state, it's just way too wet. And because of that, we're seeing a lot of problems. And one thing that we're seeing is a lot of bright yellow trees out there. Normally they'd have green leaves, but uh, this year at this time it's yellow and that's chlorosis. Uh, in fact, most of it's iron chlorosis. We're seeing a lot of it on silver maples, which we have, uh, have right here. And again, uh, I've seen it on plants that I don't normally see the chlorosis. And the reason for that is we have saturated soils. Soils are too wet, we're not getting very much root growth. And so the trees are suffering from that. We're getting uh, some chlorosis, some dieback, and now even some death. Uh, particularly spruces and other uh, conifers, we're actually getting a little bit of dieback to them now. So uh, I wish there were some ways of managing it. I've actually, believe it or not, had people talk about putting sump pumps up around their trees. A lot of us have them in their basements, but I never thought of doing it for the trees. But uh, I'm afraid we're just gonna have to wait it out, but uh, expect more damage before we see less. So I'm okay. figuring we'll see this all the way through next year. Even. Okay. So just kind of hold tight on this, and this is something that Mother Nature or the environment changing there will change it, not so much anything we can add at this time, or chemically, or? Nope, my, yeah. my tree recommendation is going to change to planting rice if we keep getting as much rain as we do. All right. So, well, thank you, panelists, for your topics of the week in the roundtable segment of our program. So, recently, Gardline traveled to McKinnon Park in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, to see what was blooming. Here are a few snapshots of the ornamental beauties near Lady Liberty and the Sunken Garden.
All right, some beautiful shots there from McKinnon Park uh, that we enjoyed here. Uh, now we get to the segment of the program where we start addressing the questions that are coming in and providing some answers to those. And so right off the bat here, John, a little bit of what you talked about as far as roundtable uh, earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, this is from Dell Rapids, and we have another one from Sioux Falls. A little bit different situations, but the symptoms are fairly similar. They have a laurel willow, yellowing of leaves, loss of two-thirds of the leaves two to three weeks ago. Fifteen years old, 30 feet tall, uh, 25 to 30 feet away from same variety of tree. That one seems to be fine. No visible signs of insects or disease. Any thoughts on what may be causing the yellowing of the leaves on that laurel? And then once you're done with that, we'll move into a linden tree. Okay. The, uh, the laurel leaf willow, which, by the way, is one of the nicest willows you can plant. I mean, the shiny green leaves, typically. Uh, and I love them. But uh, it could be that that might be in a little wetter soils, and that's not a uh, willow for extremely wet sites, surprisingly. So we may be looking at chlorosis, but I've also seen a fair amount of willow scab. It's very similar to apple scab uh, occurring on willows. And since these trees are individuals, no different than we are at the panel, it wouldn't surprise me too much that one tree may have it and the other one may not. But if the leaves are speckled, uh, yellowing, rather than having green veins and then the rest yellow, I would suspect it's probably scab. And that's just coming with this year too because of our continual wet weather. So I wouldn't worry about it. But it'll, it may come back. Does that set in the same as early spring symptoms like apple scab and yes. why, yeah. the, why the leaves fell off in this particular case probably? So yeah, good. same thing. It's defoliating just like our, our apples and crab apples are right now from apple scab. Okay. The other one is from Sioux Falls. A little different situation, however. They planted a tree six weeks ago. The leaves are turning yellow. Followed the guidelines for watering the tree, and some of the leaves all over the tree are turning yellow. What could cause the yellowing, and what are some guidelines when planting a new tree that could help aid these individuals? They well, don't indicate if it's in a new construction soil type yeah. zone or not. Well, you know, it's, any tree is going to be stressed just from transplanting, and most likely it was a container planting. One of the things I, I try to tell people to do, if you're planting from container, make sure you find the, the highest root and make that at the top of your planting soil. So it should, don't plant at the same depth you bought it at in the container. You're already going to plant it too deep. And added with our wet conditions, it wouldn't surprise me if that root system is struggling, and so that's why they're getting the yellowing leaves. Since they only planted six weeks ago, I'd go out after the show, not now, you got an hour of light afterwards, and scrape around until they find that upper root. And I mean a root of the size of your finger. And if they have to dig down a couple inches, I'd raise the whole plant up still. Um, because it's most likely planted too deep. That's the biggest culprit we see. Okay, good. Uh, John Keekafer uh, would like to know how to get rid of chiggers in the lawn and shrubs without harming other beneficial insects. Oh boy, that's a million dollar question right there. That's going to be a very difficult one to do. Chiggers are a little, chiggers actually are not insects, they're mites to begin with. And uh, they're small enough that unless you're out looking for them, you're not ever likely to see them. As far as trying to control them without hurting beneficial insects, I don't know of any good way to do that. Um, once they're in an area, they seem to just stick to that area and they're likely to be there. Uh, you know, just keeping the lawn mowed will do quite a bit to keep some of those numbers down a little bit, but they're really after those, those alternate blood sources as well. So, you know, just a matter of trying to control some of the mammals that would be present there, maybe some of the birds as well, if they're especially ground nesting birds, and then, uh, you know, just uh, try to live with them as best as possible, I think is the way to, to go about dealing yeah. with them. Now, if they're going to be going in, into an area that they know they're there, is there some repellent type? procedures, practices they can do or as individuals? Or? Yes, uh, there are a few that will help a little bit with that. The permethrin products are going to be some of the more effective ones against chiggers. Um, again, I don't know that there are any that are going to be very good against them. They're, they're not insects, they're mites, and, and so because of it, most of those products are not going to be all that effective. Um, it, light clothing, you know, some people claim that helps case of chiggers, I don't know that that's even going to do much. They're just something that you're going to have to live with, I think. Okay. So if they do get them, just the Calmine lotion and soaking in the bathtub with it. So, oh, yep. Okay. Uh, Jerry, kohlrabi. How do you know when kohlrabi is ready to be harvested? 
Okay, kohlrabi is uh, like some of the other vegetables in the garden. There is a prime time for harvesting those. Uh, and if you let it go much further than that, why well, it's like uh, chewing bark off of a tree. I mean, it's just uh, lost its, its flavor and its palatability. For kohlrabi, uh, usually you let that bulb uh, get to about uh, two inches in diameter. Uh, and that is the prime time. You let it get much further than that, it develops a very woody uh, texture to it, and uh, it's going to take a lot of cooking in order to soften it up. So shoot for that about two inch diameter. Okay, thank you. That's when you give it away, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah two inches prime, and find yeah. somebody else who wants it. Okay, <laughs> Sioux Falls, John Ball, raspberry plants, most all have good berries and are large. However, there's two plants that are very tall or taller than the others, do not bear much fruit like the others, little berries. Why does this happen and should she cut them out? Are they perhaps wild ones that got in to their patch? You know, it'd be interesting that it possibly could be. We have enough wild brambles that it could have come in from that. I've also seen occasionally you, when you buy them, you get a different variety and you'll have a couple of plants stuck out. On those, just cutting them down, of course, they're going to keep shooting back up. But if it's just a couple of plants, you're just going to have to treat them as nose hairs and just clip them down every year. Um, you know, more of the problem I'm seeing this year is people calling because they're getting very little raspberries, rather too many, and we're just getting an incredible outbreak of anthracnose on raspberries this year. People are finding small, kind of mummified berries, and all the leaves are yellow. Uh, there's the problem. It's anthracnose again due to the wet weather. This just sounds like they've got a couple of volunteer plants. Okay. Anthracnose, anything they can do about it at this time of the year or just? No, but okay. you can and I would strongly suggest because it gets in the first year's canes as well as that next spring when you're out there cutting all your canes down or part of your canes down, your, your ones that have already fruited, is spray a lime sulfur down just as the buds are breaking or, or that it it'll take care of the problem the only the only thing they're going to see though is even if it's dry next year those first year canes are already infected and so next year they're still going to see a problem even if it's dry so uh, you know to me it you just get in the habit of going out there and spraying your beds with lime sulfur which is a good fungicide really i mean it's and just let it bud break and, and that'll take care of the problem because we never know what the year's gonna bring in terms of weather. Okay, uh, from Madison, how do we get rid of snakes? They're next to the house slash flower bed. Ooh, what kind of snakes? You know, they didn't say. We know, can only assume. Gardener or That would be nose. my guess, but. Yeah. You know, it's, I mean. It's in Madison, so I'm not sure if it'd be rattlesnakes. No, I doubt yeah, that too. Not. Yeah, they would probably have a more frantic thing on that note but you know I mean the snakes are, are living under porches and you know under sidewalks and cracks in your foundation most of them are good yeah, yeah. I mean yeah. you know they're, they're beneficial right. they're beneficial um, and if they got kids you know they're gonna pick them up and run around with them um, I don't know how you'd control them really I mean they're after mice and smaller things so that's a good thing these, these non-poisonous snakes are, are looking for uh, denning areas and cooling areas, you might say. Anything that uh, affords them an opportunity to be getting out of the hot South Dakota sun, they're going to gravitate towards that. And uh, these beds that they refer to and along the foundation plantings, along the, the front of the house, that's, that's going to be the places that they're going to seek out during the heat of the day. Uh, unless you change that environment, uh, and if you're in an area that has snakes, an abundance of snakes, you're just going to have to kind of get used to them a little bit, uh, perhaps. Yeah, I so think the standard ahead. recommendation on, on foundation type plantings is 18 inches between the closest vegetation and the foundation. Help keep them out just a little bit farther away from the house, even if they're there. Okay. And caulk. Yes. Oh, I mean, seal up those yeah, openings. Yeah, seal up the openings in the house. I mean, seriously, like Jerry said, they're going to find a nice cool spot and they're either going to find a way in the basement or just have a nice place to relax until they want to come out later. But at least, you know, they're, they're good things to have. I realize you may not like to look at them. But so they are just, beneficial. Just yeah. try to change favorable environment so yeah. they don't want to be around there. And, and try to other keep, them than bear, that, keep them out of your house. If you have a young boy that is not scared of them, maybe he would catch them and relocate them. At well, another toughen location him up. Somebody. I mean, for <laughs> heaven's <laughs> sakes. Kids Boys should be, and girls. Right, I said yep. the kids should. I mean, it's, yep. Yep. Get, them, get them away. Get, get them away them from their them. Xbox and get them outside and have them play with a snake. All I mean, right, just check their pockets before they go through uh, the lobby. Yeah, right. right. <laughs>
Been there, done that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, we had a number of questions that came in this past week, and the first one is from Byberg, and we do have a, a Visual One. It says, I need to know if I should take any precautions when I fill in the deep low spot between the shed and spruce tree to avoid smothering the roots of this spruce tree that we have on the visual that's up. Snow melts collect in the depression between the tree and the shed and freezes, making a dangerous ice pond and so on. Uh, any suggestions there that uh, they can maybe do, John, without causing too much detriment to the tree? Well, it's anybody who watches this show knows I could care less if they kill a spruce. Uh, because, I mean, they, they look nice for about 20 years. Just when this guy does all this work, just to protect this tree, it's gonna start getting ugly and die anyway. But, to give him a little bit of advice, here's the rules. If he stays out from a distance equal to the height of the tree, which I don't know if he's able to do, the perspective on this picture isn't as good, he has no worries. If whatever he does outside the height, so if the tree's 20 feet tall, if he can stay 20 feet away from the tray, then he can do anything he wants with in terms of soil depth, as long as he doesn't push the water towards the trunk of the tray, and he'll be fine. If he says, no, 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 it's closer than that, 10 feet. 10 feet would be the minimum. As long as he can avoid doing any disturbances within 10, uh, 10 foot radius from the base of that tree, he should be okay. I'd be more concerned with any sculpture he does that it doesn't have water collected at the base. But as long as he's gonna have it, he says, well, I'm gonna raise the grade, but I'm not going to have the water move towards the trunk, and I'm going to stay at least 10 feet away from the base of the tree. He should be fine. Okay. And the reason for those measurements is because what's in that zone? Well, generally speaking, tree root systems go out only about as far as they are tall. So if you have a 20-foot tall tree, you generally don't have roots going much beyond 20 feet. Where the bulk of the root system, though, uh, the real base, the scaffold roots, those are found on every tree within 10 feet of the base. And so on any mature tree, you try to want to try to avoid doing any damage within 10 feet of the trunk. Okay, good, thank you. Question number two, and we have a visual on this one too. Jerry, this one's for you. About a month ago, my neighbor moved and gave me some potato plants she was growing in metal garbage cans. She said she started the plants at the bottom of the cans and gradually added dirt as the plants grew. By the time I got them, the cans were full. The plants looked pretty healthy. I want to know how I should take care of them and how often I should water and when should I harvest. They have some flowers on them a few weeks ago, but now there are no blooms and they're looking like they're starting to dry up a bit. Now I water a few times a week. I have them on my patio, east side of the house. They get most of the sun in the morning and are partially shaded in the afternoon. And that's at Rapid City. There's a number of people that uh, have limited garden space and they will grow potatoes in this manner by uh, starting out the, uh, the, the tuber, uh, the seed potato, and then they'll continue to add uh, either wood chips or straw or soil as the plant grows and continually covering that stem. What that does is stimulate the plant to make even more tubers down below. And, uh, you can get, uh, you can double, triple the production of an average potato by doing this uh, technique. Uh, it mentions that they have flowered, mm -hmm. and and that has ended. Uh, the the flowering process signals that the the tubers were starting to form down below. That's a critical time for moisture. Um, and two, three weeks after that, uh, a good deal of the tuber growth has already taken place. And uh, as the, the plant starts to die down, that's another signal that it has made the tubers and it is starting to mature those now. And so uh, a lot of times people will look for that signal of the vine dying down and uh, know that that's uh, getting up close to harvest for that particular variety. And so uh, I would assume that uh, the, the vine dying back now is the start of that mature maturation of the, uh, the tubers and harvest isn't far off. But you do still need to keep adequate moisture there to mature those tubers. And so uh, keep light, not overly excessive. You can rot those tubers if you water it too much and the drainage isn't good enough. But uh, within a while when those vines die down, it's time to harvest those potatoes. In, har <clears throat> in harvest in this situation, I imagine it would just be tipping the can over and <laughs> yeah. seeing your... Sounds like it'd be kind of simple to me. Just uh, tip it over, you know, and uh, dump out the dirt and pick wonder, up the potatoes. I wonder how they moved them in the first place. I can see why they didn't yeah. want to move them to a yeah. new house. Maybe, but... a, maybe a forklift. Or that could be. Okay. <laughs> uh, question three that came in, John Ball, for you. I have a mature purple bush that has all of a sudden developed a white hardening of the leaves. 
It looks as uh, first like bird droppings, then hardens the entire leaf. The new growth is covered with this white hardened material. We are cutting off infected leaves and spraying with copper, but it is not going away. What is it and what can we do to save the bush? Well, you know, I, they, they gave, I thought, a very good description of this problem. Now, first of all, the plant, the purple plant, is a Diablo 9 bark. Uh, and it's a very, very popular plant, and one that I like, frankly. But unfortunately, that plant does develop a problem with mildew. And the mildew on this plant is not just a whitening on the leaf. It literally, the, the leaves are almost wrapped together, and it does form something hard, almost like bird dropping. So I thought their description was good. Yes, it can be managed early on with sprays. Unfortunately, sprays now are too late. Uh, those leaves are not going to expand out of there anymore. So what I would suggest is next year they start their treatments much earlier. And of course, if we don't have wet weather, I usually don't see this problem developing that bad. For those folks that say, oh, I really like those purple or dark reddish purple uh, nine barks, and they don't want to see this mildew problem, summer wine is the bride that's come out recently, which doesn't get the mildew problem that uh, the Diablo 9 bark does. So I'd probably suggest that so you can avoid or reduce the problem. Okay. Uh, and again, plant them in sun mm -hmm. rather than shaded locations, and that'll help as well. All right, good. And we certainly appreciate the questions coming in uh, during the week for the shelf. We would encourage you, and thank goodness we had a good description with this visual, but if we can bring in the visuals that uh, are good and have some nice focusing on that, we would really appreciate that. That would certainly help out the specialists in identifying some of those problems. But they did give us a nice verbal description or written description of that that helped aid oh, in this case. I'm writing so, it down. She yeah. described that thing. Yep, just, like, just perfectly. Ah, spot on. I love it. So, all right, Jerry. Zucchini squash. The, the zucchini is dying, withering, and turning yellow, the leaves. Blooming... Uh, but setting fruit, small fruit, shrivels and then dies. Uh, there's a small garden, different location, didn't have the same problems last year. Same garden, but different spot, and they did not have the problems last year, so I don't know, would this be maybe our weather again once causing some? Could be weather related because of our cool, uh, damp, uh, perpetual rain situation that uh, is leaching uh, the nutrients on down past the root zone. It, it could be uh, nutrient deficient, uh, especially perhaps nitrogen. Uh, that would uh, give those leaves that yellow color. Uh, the, the, uh, the fruit that is rotting on it uh, could be a uh, blossom end rot. Mm -hmm. uh, that affects not only tomatoes, that's where we are the most familiar with it, but it can affect those uh, summer squash as well. And uh, that would be a calcium deficiency in the plant although calcium is moved by water, so I think there should be adequate water to move the calcium this year. Um, another thing I, I suspect here is the possibility of the squash vine borer. Mm -hmm. And uh, having said that, I'm gonna turn it over to John. Well, yeah, we actually have a couple different ones that could be in there. Squash vine borer, I think, would be the, the common one, and that's uh, one that you'd certainly wanna look for. In the last couple of years now, we've had a number of cases come in like this that have actually been common stock borer, which is a different moth, different family even, and those caterpillars look somewhat different in there. The, the squash vine borer is going to be more of a uniform color caterpillar in there. The common stock borer will have uh, black and white stripes on it if you cut open that. But the way you're going to look for that in there is you want to go back to where that vine is dying off and actually cut it open there and see if you've got a caterpillar in there. If you do, um, you're probably dealing with a number of them. It's probably not just one that's doing it in, in each plant, but each vine that would be dying coming off of that main root system there would have a separate caterpillar in it. And uh, as far as treating them, once they're into those stalks, it's pretty difficult to treat them for this year. The important thing in that is this fall, when you take those vines off, you wanna make sure you destroy those thoroughly burn them or uh, chop them in such a way that anything that might be in them or around them would be destroyed and then make sure you till that soil fully to get everything out of there as well. Okay. Would, if they weren't quite pollinated properly, would the plant uh, abort the if, small fruit If like uh, that proper fertilization has not taken place, then that, that small little squash behind the blossom is going to abort and will never actually form 
Uh, so it could be a, a pollination, uh, fertilization uh, problem there. We, we've just got less pollinators working our gardens these days uh, because of the honeybee problems, uh, the colony collapse disorder and whatnot. We really need to encourage all the pollinators we possibly can yeah. into our gardens. So it could be a couple, a number of different Any things, and they'll just things. have to go out and do a little exploring to see, exactly. narrow that down. Okay, good, thank you. Well, up next, we visited the home of Gary Larson, a biology professor at SDSU who specializes in plants and grasses native to South Dakota. Gary highlights two native plants and how to keep these perennials growing for the years to come. Hello, I'm Gary Larson, a professor of biology in the Department of Biology and Microbiology. Uh, we're here in my yard today to talk about a topic that's gaining greater popularity among gardeners across the country, and that is the use of native plants in the uh, garden and uh, the yard landscape. Uh, I'm featuring today a couple of beard tongues, uh, the first of which is actually found in the Black Hills of South Dakota and the other parts of western South Dakota. Uh, the smooth beard tongue is uh, similar to uh, the uh, digitalis that you see for sale in uh, some of the nurseries, but this one is native to uh, South Dakota. And uh, like most beard tongues, you have to realize that the plant is uh, only uh, a short-lived perennial. And that means that we need to allow this plant to reseed itself in order to perpetuate it. Uh, these plants here have actually lived for two years, uh, flowering the first and second years, but I lost about half of the plants through the winter, which is normal for penstemon. But as you can see here at ground level, we have a lot of new seedlings arising from seed from uh, last year's crop, and those now will be uh, the flowering plants for the subsequent year. Now, the use of native plants uh, makes a lot of sense because uh, they're low maintenance plants, they're already adapted to our location and our soils. Uh, they don't require the additional water and fertilizer that many of our high maintenance plantings uh, require, but we do have to be aware of uh, their cultural characteristics. Uh, now we're going to take a look at another beard tongue in the backyard, but it's one that is past flowering, and so we'll uh, show you what the flowering specimen of that one will look like. Uh, here we're looking at another beard tongue, this one called uh, uh, Big Flowered Penstemon or Shell Leaf Penstemon. And uh, this plant, of course, as you can see, isn't particularly attractive right now because it just finished uh, flowering or nearly finished flowering last week. And uh, right now, though, we do see the production of the capsules that are all important in perpetuating this plant. It is often actually a biennial, meaning that next year we're going to have some seedlings uh, that will then uh, flower the subsequent year. So for a lot of uh, native perennial plants, you have to have some patience, allow them to uh, undergo at least one year of growth oftentimes before they will flower. Well, we certainly want to thank Gary for that information on those plants. And now we'll get right back to the questions because we have quite a few coming in tonight. Uh, from Watertown, Jerry, pumpkins and cucumbers, lots of flowers but no fruit. The flowers are drying up and they don't produce. Why or what can she do? Well, uh, pumpkins and cucumbers and uh, most of those vine type crops in the cucurbit family uh, are uh, dioecious. Uh, meaning that they have two different flowers on the same plant and usually the first flowers to form are the male flowers and uh, they're not going to produce any fruit. Later on in the season you start getting the female flowers setting in there too and then you're, provided you have uh, plenty of the pollinators in your garden and that's not just honeybees but bumblebees and uh, some of the digger bees that uh, John talked about earlier even some of the flies and the parasitic wasps do a pretty good job of uh, pollinating these. But as long as you get pollination and actual fertilization, 
why then the, the female flowers do set fruit and, and mature that fruit. Now to recognize the two different blossoms, the male blossoms are not going to have the little baby fruit behind it. The female blossoms are the ones that have the little miniature cucumber right behind that blossom. So that's a way to recognize which ones are which. And as long as that female blossom gets properly fertilized, it will set fruit. All right, so be patient at this time. Be patient. Okay. The second part of that question is, uh, lawn. They're starting to get quack grass around the edges. Is there anything they can do about the quack grass? Now, they don't say anything about saving the other grass or... Yeah, so. yeah well, but we better <laughs> yeah. talk about both okay. the options. Right. I mean, actually, there is nothing that will selectively take out cra uh, quack grass in this case and not have collateral damage on the desirable grass in the lawn. Uh, about the only option is to bite the bullet, so to speak, and, and use Roundup in order to try to eliminate the quack grass. But realize that Roundup, or the glyphosate chemical, the active ingredient is glyphosate, uh, it, it's, it's going to kill everything that's green and growing at the time. And so it's gonna take out the lawn as well. Uh, the other thing, uh, it's usually better on most of these uh, perennial, tough to control weeds to, to set them up and, and do that fall spraying. About the time that they're manufacturing food to put it down into the root to carry it through the winter and initiate next spring's growth is the time to put those products on so that it's readily absorbed and translocated into the root and you get root kill and all. Okay. And they said quack grass, but if there's any doubt, they might want to take it in the extension office, identify oh, to make sure if it's mm -hmm. quack not versus crab, because there's two totally different. Uh, okay. A lot of people uh, just hang quack grass on yeah. that. Uh, if it's a weed, it's got to be quack grass. Yeah. But identification is very important here to get the right product to control the particular grass that it is. Okay, John Ball from Dell Rapids. 30-year-old blue spruce. Bottom branches of blue spruce are hanging on the ground. When would be the best time to remove these bottom branches? Also have uh, an evergreen 10 foot tall that wants to, rem wants to remove the top two feet off. Uh, when would be the best time to do this? Well, let's answer the second part first. And the answer to that's never. Uh, you don't want to cut the top off an evergreen. What's going to happen then is any side branches below it will bend up and you'll have multiple canopies. But there's something else. Let me else. go back. They did right here. It's an arborvitae actually. Oh, evergreen. Okay. Ten Still feet not. tall. Wants to remove the top. So no, that I, makes any difference. Uh, no, it doesn't make much of a difference. Yeah. I, I hate to see that done. Now, again, this always gets back to choose a plant that's going to get the size you want. Now, what they might be able to do is not bring it down but hold it at the height that's at and by a little proper shearing during the summer, they can control the future growth of that plant. You can remove about half the new growth that formed. Uh, but I wouldn't cut it back to where you just are looking at sticks. They don't re-bush out very easily. So you can hold it where it's at, but you can't make it smaller. Right. In terms of the spruce, I'm surprised the 30-year-old spruce has lower branches still. Uh, and I'd prefer that they leave them because it keeps the ground a little cooler and moist, not that that's needed this year. But uh, if they do want to limit up, generally we'd say now because typically it's warm and dry and that's a good time to do it without transferring any diseases. But I guess I'm going to hope that August is warm and dry and if that occurs, that's a good time to prune. And, and so always remember the rule of thumb, if, if you have a 30 foot tall tree and the canopy's from the base to the top, you can never take off more than a third of that. So, 10 feet would be the maximum, and they're going to have a tree that looks like a lollipop at that point. But if you take the lower five feet, that's fine. But removing the lower branches is not a standard recommendation to do for that plant unless they really want to. No. I, I, I think I a lot of people think that's just something you should do automatically, and it's not the case. No, no. Yeah. I mean, we get people say, well, I want to mow underneath it, or I want to do something underneath it. But yeah, leave it branched to the ground. It's actually better for the tree. But quite often, because of limited light and, and poor air circulation, we get disease in that, and the lower branches die out naturally. Okay. But they can prune them. Well, we're going to go to some of the other questions that came in uh, during the week, and we have some visuals on these as well. Jerry, the first one is for you. It deals with tomatoes, and this would be our visuals four and five. Uh, what they have are they have tomatoes that are curling up, dying from the top down on this particular case. Uh, the plant in question, early girl, uh, they also have some brandy wines and they have some beef steaks. They water regularly and from the bottom, 
uh, not from the top. So any thoughts on what might be happening here? Looks uh, top down versus bottom up. But they're pretty sure as far as the, the no, absolutely no herbicide, pesticides used nearby. Right. And, and from the pictures, I can tell immediately that it is not a herbicide related, although it, uh, that is a very common problem on tomatoes this time of the year. Um, there's two very common diseases going on in the tomatoes right now. One is septoria leaf spot and the other one is early blight. Septoria leaf spot, and they mentioned uh, that it isn't coming up from the bottom. This one's coming from the top and going down. Septoria leaf spot always starts from the bottom of the plant. Uh, it comes from diseased debris that was left in the garden. Uh, the rain splashes it up onto the first leaves and then each sub subsequent rain or overhead watering um, spreads it further on up the plant and splashes it actually up the plant. So that starts at the bottom and works its way up. Since this started at the top and is going down, I'm suspecting that this is more of an early blight situation, uh, that it has become infected on the top of the plant and, and spreading on down through the plant. Now, the, the photos were not close enough or sharp enough to really tell, but the way to determine whether or not it's early blight is by uh, looking closely at those leaves and if the the diseased portion of that leaf has concentric circles in it. Uh, that's a dead giveaway for early blight. And at that point, um, I don't know, it depends on how far along the disease is, but the recommendation uh, for a preventative fungicide to perhaps slow down the spread of that on the plant would be a fungicide containing the active ingredient uh, chlorothalonil. Okay. Now the pictures indicate it looks like they may be using grass clippings as mulch mm -hmm. and does the spacing look okay? Or uh, does that help with air circulation or not? You, you have a good point there, Steve. It, it sure does look like uh, these plants are very close together and they should spread them out much more so that they've got good air circulation going through there. Uh, so that when it does rain, the uh, foliage doesn't stay wet for as uh, long a period of time. It dries off quicker. That will cut down on many of these leaf spot diseases and the blights uh, because they're fungal, uh, they're fungal diseases and they're favored by wet foliage that remains wet for a period of time. Okay. And then one other thing real quick, Jerry, is, is if they're using grass clippings, do we have any problems with herbicide and grass clippings causing well, problems? Well, absolutely. That's a good point. Uh, you never want to use grass clippings uh, that uh, are coming from a lawn that uh, has been applied with a herbicide of some sort to control weeds. Uh, you you want to delay using those uh, for at least uh, three to four cuttings before it's safe to use those grass clippings back in the garden, especially around tomatoes. Uh, tomatoes are very, very sensitive to herbicide and just those grass clippings, the, the vapor can lift out of there, it can volatilize and lift into those plants and cause herbicide injury. But that would be a whole different set of symptoms here that would cupped, curled, distorted uh, leaves. Okay, thanks Jerry. Uh, John Ball, can you tell me what is wrong with my peony bushes? And this would be our images six and seven. It looks like iron deficiency, but giving them iron does no good and maybe actually makes it worse. Can you tell me what these flowers are? I planted seeds last spring and they didn't bloom but came up this year and are blooming in white, pink, and red. Thank you. So there are two questions. There, there is, two questions right. in that. So well, the pictures, the graphics actually, I don't think deal with the peonies. Right. But the, the visuals deal with what are these? Yeah, well, and Jerry and I were talking about the iron chlorosis. First of all, regardless of whether it's a tree or a shrub or even your peony, that um, uh, when you're trying to add iron at this time of year, it's not going to do anything. Iron needs to be applied at the beginning when the growth first starts. But Jerry and I were wondering if, if on the peony, while you still can have iron deficiencies, if it might instead might be a nitrogen deficiency. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, we were thinking again because of those wet, moist conditions. I, I have seen this chlorosis appearing on a large range of plants. As I, so it may be looking at that. Now the flower, what are you guys thinking it is? Well, John and I kind of been talking here while you were talking, John. I've got two Johns. <laughs> yep. um, but uh, it, it's difficult to tell because that's not a close enough up picture of the foliage really to, to give us the key that we need to, to be looking at. Uh, it could be yarrow, 
but I don't see that ferny type of uh, foliage that you would see on yarrow. And if it's yarrow, if you take some of that foliage and crush it, and it's got kind of a um, sagey, real fragrant uh, scent to it, then that could be yarrow. I'm thinking it's more uh, a garden phlox. You know, phlox, because it looks like it's opposite branching. Yep, yep. And, and I'd probably go more with phlox. I what about so. you, John Kay? Well, yeah, I don't know. My first thought was the uh, yarrow, but uh, it could be phlox. It, the leaf looks just a little bit different. I'd wonder. I guess the color variations in the flowers certainly could be phlox. I, well, we yeah. got phlox and I'm, yarrow. What, what, I'm betting phlox. All right, what this, what this person <laughs> needs to do is drop one of those in an envelope. So next week we've got exactly. the plant. Yeah. And we'll find out something completely different. But That's you know, right. we can we can always return to the question next week. All right. Yeah, bring bring it back. Have them, yeah. mail us one. But a padded envelope, or sometimes they get when they go run through the cancellation machine, don't they get a little uh, unidentifiable? Some of those not to us. We're a CSI lab okay. here. Okay. Right. Right. A couple sheets of newspaper. Okay. Put it under some heavy books and let it dry for a day or two in that newspaper, and then. Right. Ship it off. Don't okay. put it in a plastic bag and leave mold by the time okay. we get right. it. Don't, don't put wet napkins in with it or that sort of thing. Yep. Okay, good. Uh, and then our graphic eight here, uh, John Ball again, or whoever would like to jump in. Please help me identify and get rid of this vine. The local extension office or district conservation, uh, conservationist can tell me, cannot tell me what it is. It, it grows uh, all over our property, intertwines with the trees. They've tried 2,4-D, it seems to have no real effect. Uh, any thoughts? Yeah, it'll eat it for breakfast. I okay. mean, yeah, 2,4-D, it ain't gonna do nothing. Yeah. Uh, to me, this looked like clematis when I was looking at the leaf, and I think Jerry over here was nodding. And what do you think, Jerry? How could they get rid of that? Absolutely, well, um, I'm wondering if uh, cutting it off at the, the base of the stem and treating the stem uh, wouldn't be a way to... Uh, You'd have to paint the stem, I mean, Paint the stem, yeah. yeah. Uh, would those berries be common to clematis? It looks like white berries down in the lower right, doesn't it? You know, but the thing, of, thing about that, John, is when I looked at it, and, and my eyesight's going, either that or pictures are just getting fuzzier at this stage of my life, but when I looked at those leaves, the leaves didn't seem to match on the, on the fruit it's as... Two different types of leaves. I, I, yeah. I think we're looking at two different plants. Okay. You know, okay. hey, this is another one. Where are you coming from? Uh, Piedmont. And they talk about the, the burn, the forest fires, and it comes back right after the forest fires, too, yeah. which is yeah. typical for out in the hills there. Yeah. Boy, if they, could, if they could send us the berries, I mean, just a little bit of the stick with the berries, too, that would be cool, because I, I think we're looking at something, we may be looking at something unrelated to the other three pictures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they might have two separate plants going there. Yeah, which yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me. So a little more uh, for you to look at would help really to identify that. Yeah, it's quicker. again, and, and the reason for this, for those who are, are watching, is, is the, the, the picture showing the leaf is just beautiful, very crisp and clean, but the picture showing the fruit is almost everything's out of focus. And so all we can see is there's some white round stuff there, but the leaf doesn't seem to resemble the, the clematis leaf. So, nor is the fruit, as John said, John Kay said, it would be common with that. Uh, Jerry from Dalton, uh, we, ta or we talked about this a little bit ago, but if you could uh, clarify this. What do you do with the seed heads of the onions? Can you keep or replant them or use those seeds of the onions? I guess I wouldn't advise it. Uh, if you're going for storage onions, uh, you need to start with uh, either plants or sets in order to have good success on that. Uh, and, and that difference between plants or sets comes down to the individual and their preference. I will mention though on sets, um, you need to kind of go through that package of sets that you get and take the extremely large ones out and uh, dispose of those. Only plant the smaller ones because they're going to result in your best uh, storage onions. The, the large sets uh, have so much size on them that they're encouraged to go ahead and form those seed heads and those stiff necks and whatnot, and that's not what you want. Okay, real quick here, John Keekafer, cucumber beetles. Anything you can do that is non-spray? Uh, non-spray, you could hand pick. That's gonna be about your best option on that oh, one. There's excitement. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. nothing like hobby. spending an evening picking beetles, is there? Okay. <laughs> so, any particular, any organic at all? Uh, there are some organic type chemicals out there, chemicals that are from natural 
products and uh, okay. some of them will help a little bit. All right, so hand picking. So. Well, that's all the time we have tonight. Uh, just to let you know, GuardLine repeats twice each week on South Dakota Public Broadcasting Digital Channel 3, which is also known as the Create Channel. The Encore broadcast can be seen Thursdays at 11 a.m. Central and Saturdays at 4 p.m. Central. Now check with your local listings to find the SDPB Digital Channel 3 where you live. Now time to wrap up. We want to thank our panel of experts, John Keykafer from the Brookings County Extension Office, uh, Jerry Mills from the Brown County County Extension Office, and John Baller Extension Forestry Specialist. Thanks to our phone volunteers of Brookings Master Gardeners, and thanks to you for watching and calling. Have a good evening. This program is funded in part by Swiftel Communications.